Live from Candlestick Park in San Francisco, California, it's Mets Baseball 89, as tonight, the Mets take on the San Francisco Giants. And Mets Baseball 89 is brought to you this evening by Bud Light, the light beer with a first name and taste. Everything else is just a light. By Nissan, building cars for people who want more than just a means of getting from here to there. Nissan, built for the human race. By Manufacturers Hanover, the financial source worldwide. By the New Jersey Bell Yellow Pages, no other book can match it. New Jersey Bell, a Bell Atlantic company. By Sure, be confident of both wetness and odor protection. Raise your hand if you're sure. By the New York Daily News, New York's hometown paper. And by RC Cola. Some people go out of their way for the taste of RC. Pitching for the Mets tonight, it's right-hander David Cohn, who's 3-3 three three with an ERA of 3.13. And on the mound for the Giants, it's right-hander Mike Kruko, 3-2 with an ERA of 3. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Rob Kiner, along with Steve Sabrisky and Tim McCarver on a cool evening here in Candlestick. <laughs> and it's been cool for the Mets on this road trip. They have won only two while losing five of the seven games played. And for the first time in the career of Davey Johnson, he will go home from California with a losing record. The Mets have only two more games to play out here. And the Mets, in their six games out of seven, have scored three or less runs, Tim in those ball games that they have really had their problems with mm -hmm. and it's uh, again a problem where it looks like the panic button could be pushed well i don't think you could push the panic button but i do think that there are certain times during a season ralph where you individually as a player and a team as a, a group whether it's the beginning middle or end of the season ha you, you have to really uh, take stock of your situation you can't panic and realize it's only may and there are a lot of, uh, ba there's a lot of baseball left. The Mets are still only two and a half games out of first place. And you really have to take stock of your situation and realize what phase you're in. The Mets are on a down phase right now, but it's nothing that a couple of victories in a row won't cure. And they're going back home uh, this weekend and obviously would like to go back home winning the last two games here at Candlestick. Well, last year the Mets got off to a great start and then played 500 ball for 82 ball games mm -hmm. and then came back on again. And the same players are here this year, so you really can't get too too nervous. Yeah, and maybe uh, th it's just to reverse this year. Maybe they'll play 500 ball until the middle of June and then uh, uh, tear it up for the last three and a half months. We'll see. But right now, they're not scoring runs. They're not scoring runs, and they're going against Mike Krugel, a man who has beat them 21 times. Mike Krugel on the mound for the San Francisco Giants, but the Mets have David Cohn on the mound for them, so it should be a good ball game. And we'll be back with that game in just a moment after this word from Bud Light. Well, you can tell by the flags blowing in the breeze here that it's Candlestick Park and the Mets against the Giants in the second game of a three-game series and four the Giants. It'll be the Polish Prince, Mike Kruko, on the mound with a record of three and two. He's one and zero against the Mets. He has an earned run average of three. He has worked 33 innings so far this year, giving up just 23 hits. He has walked 14 and struck out 15. The opposition hitting 197 against him. And the lineup for the Mets: Lynn Dykstra leading off and playing center field. Second baseman Tim Tuffle batting second. Howard Johnson, the shortstop, batting third. Daryl Strawberry in right field, hitting fourth. Kevin McReynolds, the left fielder, batting fifth. Dave Magadan at first base with Hernandez out until August. Greg Jeffries, the third baseman, is hitting seventh this evening. That's a new slot for him. Mackie Sasser behind the plate because of Carter's injury. Gary resting comfortably, but also out until August. And David Cohn, the pitcher, batting ninth. Carter with a knee operation the other day and out for two months as we get set for the start of the ball game. Lenny Dykstra will lead it off, hitting 282, one home run, eight runs batted in. And he attempts to bunt, and it's strike one. It is ball one. The third base umpire said he didn't go for it. The defense for the Giants. Clark at first, Thompson at second, Uribe at shortstop, Riles at third. Mitchell, Butler, and Maldonado in the outfield left to right. The catcher is Kennedy, and the count, one ball, no strikes to Dykstra. And the pitch back, a fastball fouled away. As we mentioned, Mike Kruko with a record of 21 and 7 against the Mets. That's pretty good policy. You saw Dykstra try to draw Riles, the third baseman, in, and on the fastball, he tried to drive it by him. Nothing wrong with that thinking. And he has Riles in close again as they anticipate the possible bunt. 
And the breaking ball. It is low for ball two. Two balls, one strike. There you get an idea of Ernest Riles, the third baseman, and Dykstra hits the ball effectively on the ground to third and to left field, and that's what he was trying to do on that first swing. We see, we'll see if he does it again. And the fastball that time out of the strike zone, so it's three and one. Dykstra, a 279 lifetime batter with 28 home runs. He has 113 stolen bases. And against Kruko, he's hitting only 176 in his major league career with one home run. And he takes ball four, and Dykstra works out a walk. Kruko noted for fine control, but walking his first batter, his 15th walk this year. That will bring up Tim Tuffle. Tuffle hitting 250 with no home runs, four runs batted in. <laughs> you know, he, you mentioned Kruko's control. He's improved that because when he was right out of high school, he was pitching semi-pro ball, and he walked 17 in a seven-inning game one time, pitching a no-hitter. <laughs> Few people left on base in that one. I guarantee you. A breaking ball to Tuffle, a called strike. And a balk is called on that pitch. So the second balk this year by Kruko, and once again the balk call getting into the ball game. Now let's see if we can pick it up. We think it was in that discernible stop that was supposed to not be called as much this year as last year, but we've seen it three times on this road trip. Roger McDowell lost the game at Dodger Stadium on Sunday, balking in the winning run in the bottom of the 12th. So now back to work at the plate, and that pitch called a strike as Tuffle takes. Tuffle hitting 200 with no home runs against Kruko, and a 296 batter with one home run against the Giants in his major league career. A lifetime hitter, 265 with 49 home runs. Six year veteran in the major leagues, and this ball hit hard but fouled down the left side. Last year, Kruko had a record of seven and four, but three of his wins were against the Mets and no losses. He has won 123 games in his major league career and 21 of them against the Mets. Was with the Cubs, the Philadelphia Phillies, and now with the Giants. He has really dominated the Mets, but not other clubs. As a matter of fact, 13 wins, the most wins that he has against other clubs. One time had a seven game winning streak against the New York Mets. And he comes back with a curve. It's lined down the left field line for a base hit. Dykstra scores easily. Tuffle trying for two, and the throw is in time. Second time in the two games with the Giants here at Candlestick, the Mets have had a runner throwing out trying to catch. The extra base with no one out. Well, you know, in a, in a situation like this, Kevin Mitchell just makes a good play. Tuffle hits a good pitch, but watch Kevin Mitchell, the left fielder, stop, get in good position, and make a strong throw to second. The quick tag on Tuffle had him easily at second base. That's just a fine play by Kevin Mitchell. If a guy makes a play like that in the process of taking an extra base, you got to tip your hat to him. Mitchell played six positions for the New York Mets when he was with them back in 1986, and he also played one of those positions at shortstop. He was a catcher in high school. They moved him to third base, and he's played around since then, and now in left field for the Giants. Howard Johnson, the batter, and he takes the first pitch for strike one. And this pitch hit foul back out of play. Johnson hitting 258 so far this year with 10 home runs, 26 runs batted in. One for four in yesterday's ball game. He's hitting only 190 against Kruko, but he does have two home runs against the Prince. 258 against the Giants' lifetime, with a total of eight home runs against San Francisco. So Kruko, with a two-strike count to Howard Johnson, the Mets leading one nothing as they get underway here at Candlestick Park. Curveball, but just low, and it's one and two. Kruko with a fine curveball. He was a winning pitcher against the Mets at Shea Stadium. 
Back on May the 20th, worked five and two thirds innings, gave up only four hits, allowed no runs. And the losing pitch in that game was Bob Ojeda. One and two the count. Two and two. Johnson with a lifetime average of 251 in his major league career. He has had 110 home runs. Wire from the Detroit Tigers. The 2 2 pitch, again the curveball and ball three. So it's a full can now, three balls and two strikes. Davey Johnson looking on, and as we mentioned in the opening, this will be the first time in his career with the New York Mets in 11 trips to the West Coast he will go back from California without having a winning record. And the fastball hit in the air in foul territory Kennedy back and he will get to it and he makes the play for the out. So Johnson fouls out. It's a lot of room in foul territory here, but nothing should be taken for granted. Because of the wind and the elements, no play is routine, and you see there that Kennedy does not have a routine play on that pop fly. Everything in the air in this ballpark is an adventure. As Kruko gets set to work to Daryl Strawberry. Strawberry hitting 235 with 11 home runs. 23 runs batted in and the first pitch of fastball a called strike. Darrell two for three yesterday. Lifetime 223 average against the Giants with 12 home runs. And that pitch a ball and it's one ball and one strike. Strawberry has not handled Kruko well at all. He's hitting 154 against him and it is called a swinging strike by third base umpire Terry Tata. Dana DeMuth, the umpire behind home plate. Jerry Lane, the umpire at first. Bruce Freming, the umpire at second. And Terry Tate at third. And again, the slow curveball. And Strawberry fouls it back out of play. You could see with that swing that Strawberry was fooled. Whenever the hitter has to commit with his hands, when those hands go forward with the body, then the pitcher's got him. You lose all your strength. The hands have to stay back for you to hit effectively. You can be fooled on the curve by the body going forward but the hands have to be back. Pervading wind blows toward right field in this ballpark. And that pitch a fastball to move him back two and two. This ballpark has the largest diminishing effect on batting averages of any park in the National League. And a swing and a miss and Strawberry is struck out and that ends the inning. But the Mets get one run on one hit. And no one left on base to score at the end of one half inning. The Mets won. The Giants coming up. And here's a word from Nissan. For the Mets, it'll be David Cohn on the mound with a record of three and three and earned run average of 3.13. He has worked 63 in the third innings, giving up 52 hits. He has walked 22 and struck out 54. The opposition hitting 227 against David so far this year. San Francisco's lineup includes Brett Butler leading off, Robbie Thompson, the second baseman, following Brett, Will Clark, the National League's leading hitter, batting third, left fielder Kevin Mitchell hitting fourth, Ernest Riles, the third baseman, batting fifth, Candy Maldonado. What a what a terrific name! It's a nice name, Candy Maldonado, playing right field batting six Terry Kennedy the catcher hitting seventh Jose Uribe the shortstop batting eighth and Mike Fruko the pitcher batting ninth the defense for the Mets Magadan at first Tuffle at second Johnson at shortstop and Jeffries at third and Reynolds Dykstra and Strawberry in the outfield left to right and the catcher of the night Mackie Sasser a former giant for the Giants it'll be Brett Butler to lead it off Butler hitting 305 with one home run, 12 runs batted in, his on base average 287. And he can bunt. He's had nine bunt base hits so far this year, 20 last year. And the Mets looking for the possible bunt attempt. And the first pitch a called strike. Going against San Francisco on May 19th. 
had a no decision in the 10 inning ball game. He worked eight innings in that game, gave up five hits, allowed two runs, and Butler fouls off the fastball. Strike two of the count. Butler, a lifetime 281 hitter in seven years in the major leagues with 33 home runs. He's a fine leadoff batter. He has had 285 stolen bases in his career. One of two men to lead both legs in three base hits. And the fastball moves him back one and two. Wahoo Sam Crawford, the other. Oh, Wahoo, yeah. You remember him? Yeah. And a fly ball to left field. McReynolds, the left fielder. And he puts it away. So Butler is out. Butler with two RBIs and sacrifice flies in yesterday's ball game. He got the big hits that gave the Giants a victory. And now the batter will be Rob Thompson. Thompson hitting 275 home runs, 15 runs batted in. He was the 1986 Sporting News Rookie of the Year. And he takes a fastball for strike one. He's a good player. He's durable, plays every day. He's got surprising pop with his swing. He may strike out a little bit too much, not real selective. But he is a good number two player. Makes a double play very well. The Giants leading the National League in double plays with 42. He's a good player. And the breaking ball for ball one and one. He's done very well against the Mets. His lifetime average 361 against the Mets with three home runs. Give you an idea about his lifetime average against the Mets 361 his lifetime average in the National League 247 two for five yesterday. And he fouls a fastball back I'd like to correct that the Giants have 53 double plays not 42 um, they're number one in the National League they're also number one in fielding with a 983 percent. They're number two in hitting at 251. And they're number one in home runs with 40. They have one more than the Mets. And they're number one in runs scored with 208. It's unusual for the Giants to be that good defensively in this ballpark. Five, that will be a base hit to center field. Johnson makes a try, but it gets on by him, and the Giants have their first base run. Davey Johnson trying to get more offense tonight has moved Howard Johnson to short Jeffries at third and Tuffle at second and Hojo didn't appear to see that ball real well. He didn't have a good jump on that line drive at all. I'm not saying he would have caught it had he had a good jump. That ball by him in a hurry. And now the National League's leading hitter at the plate Will Clark Clark hitting 363 with nine home runs 39 runs batted in he leads in hitting it's 363 he's number one in hits with 65 number one in runs with 36 he's having a tremendous year he's number two in runs batted in and tied for second in multiple hit games he's also tied for second on, on base average at 450 that means he's on base with either a base hit or a walk or being hit by a pitch ball. 45% of the time and he hits in front of Kevin Mitchell who is the leader in almost all of the offensive departments. Thompson with 56 career stolen bases. He's a good base runner too. And Clark lines at the left field coming up on the ball is McReynolds to make the catch and Clark is out on a hard hit ball to the left. Thompson back to first base and now Kevin Mitchell the batter. Mitchell hitting 292 with 14 home runs. He leads the National League in that department. 44 runs batted in, also leading the National League there. He leads in slugging percentage at 643 and extra base hits with 34 and two base hits with 17 and total bases with 119. Kevin Mitchell, the former Mets player. Mitchell in 1986 for the Mets at 277 with 12 home runs. And as 
we mentioned earlier, he played six different positions for the Mets that year, the year they were the world's champions. And he takes a fastball for ball one. Mitchell hitting 274 with four home runs lifetime against the Mets. 0 for 4 in yesterday's ball game. Mitchell was traded to the Padres in the McReynolds trade and then traded on up here July 4th to the Giants. Tremendously popular player. Giants call him the Boogie Bear. That's an affectionate nickname if I ever heard one. He is just as popular on the Giants as he was on the Mets. Outstanding guy. He, he, he used really to call is. 747 when he played <laughs> he, for the Mets. I think he leads the league in different nicknames. He's had about four or five different nicknames. What a year he's having, and this ball hit high in the air at Playwell, but this will be an adventure. It's up there. Strawberry's going to make the call, and now Dykstra makes it, and Dykstra makes the catch. Anything hit that high in the air can go anywhere. But Dykstra does track it down. One hit, one left. The score at the end of one, the Mets won and the Giants nothing. Now here's a word from AT&T. Well, we're going out of the top of the second. The Mets leading one nothing, and Kevin McReynolds will lead it off, and he gets a curveball for a called strike. McReynolds hitting 274 with five home runs, 18 runs batted in. That was Jeff Mitchell's version of Claude Range. You saw that, the cap on the glove? We might have to take another look at that. And this one hit down the left field line, foul, strike two. <laughs> that was funny, the Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> Mike Kruko on the mound for the Cubs. The Cubs, I should say, for the Giants. He was with the Cubs in the early part of his career. And this ball fouled back out of play. There it is again. Doesn't it look like Michael Crawford? <laughs> Michael Crawford performing in the Phantom of the Opera in New York. Now he's out here in L.A. But Claude Range, remember that great, the, the Invisible Man, then the Invisible Man returns? How do you know? <laughs> How do you know which one came back? <laughs> <laughs> and McReynolds fouls another one back. Count stays at strike two. Kruko almost blown off the mound here with a gust of wind just prior to that last pitch. Stu Miller in the All-Star game a few years back actually was blown off the mound and a ball called on him when he was blown over. San Francisco's version of stickball in this ballpark. Bob Laurie, the owner of the San Francisco Giants, trying to get a new ballpark. It was put on the ballot last year and bolted down. And he has said that if they don't come up with a park for him, that he will move the franchise when the lease is up, which is sometime around 1994. The location of this park in the windiest place in San Francisco. And McReynolds loops it out towards second base where Thompson makes the play. Thompson came into this game with 60 consecutive games without making an error dating back to last season. The record is 91 held by Joe Morgan. That's at second base. Of course, Kevin Elster played in 88 consecutive games without making an error for the Mets over the past two years, and that was a new record for shortstops. Now Dave Magadan, the batter, hitting 304 with one home run, six runs batted in. Magadan has been hot. In his last seven games, he's batted 458. <laughs> Gives you a pretty good idea. And a strike call. Between pitches, that's what Clark's been doing. He puts the turtleneck right up around his nose to keep that wind out of there. The conditions here are just miserable, no question about it. And there again, that's why it's unusual that they are leading the league in fielding in this ballpark. That's amazing. It is amazing, plus the fact that the ground in the infield, the dirt part of the infield, is very tough. A couple of bad hop base hits yesterday. This ball hit the center field a long way for Butler, but he tracks it down. 
So Kruko picking up two quick outs here in the second. The Mets leading one nothing, and the batter will be Greg Jeffries. Jeffries hitting 185. He has no home runs. 15 runs batted in. One for four yesterday. Jeffries family from an area right near the ballpark. And they are here watching their son try to break out of the deep slump that he has been in all this year. Last year he just tore the leg up when he came up in September. Hit 321 and 29 games with six home runs. And to help spark the Mets along with Mookie Wilson to a strong finish where they ended up winning 100 games. One ball, one strike. Jeffries against Kruko is two for two. He's perfect against him in his major league career. one the Giants nothing now here's a word from Tropicana Mets leading one nothing as you take a look at the crowd here at Candlestick and there are the Mets players in the bench bundled up against the cold here in Candlestick Park how about uh, Doc Gooden there Ralph we saw uh, his high school catcher before the game came all the way from Tampa, Florida, Tony Lopez. And his hand didn't look too bad, did it? No. Uh -uh. Catching all that smoke when look he was in high school. Mine does. <laughs> <laughs> Ernest Riles leads it off here in the bottom of the second. Doc will be going Friday night when the Mets return against the Pittsburgh Pirates. He'll be opposed by John Smiley. It should be a great game if you don't have your tickets. Still plenty of seats available for Friday and Saturday evenings. And Sunday's a sellout. Then the Mets hit the road again. A ball and no strikes to Riles. Fly ball left center. Dykstra over in one out. Four fly balls recorded by David Cohn. Two to left and two to center. That's a good thing to get that ball hit in the air to left field in this ballpark because the wind holds it up. Over toward right, it will take the ball out of the ballpark. We see Dykstra there, and David Cohn has allowed one hit. It's one to nothing. Mets here in the bottom of the second. When the Mets arrived on Sunday evening, Lenny's brother was here, his two sisters, Lenny, one of six children. And his brother, I'll tell you about his brothers, Candy Maldonado steps up, struggling at 189. Kevin Dykstra is a umpire, an umpire in the California League. A strike to Maldonado, one and one. And Kevin saw the afternoon game yesterday and then drove to Modesto last night with his partner in A ball. They have only two umpires. And they umpired the game last night, Modesto and I think Fresno. I think it was Fresno and Modesto. It's interesting. They start out in those low minors with two umpires, and they Tough. get to three, and they get to the major leagues. They got four. With two umpires, you got a busy night. Two and two to Maldonado. People talk about the life of a minor league player. What about the life of a minor league umpire? Much harder. Maldonado down on strikes. That's the first strikeout for David Cohn. And with two outs and nobody on, Terry Kennedy, the batter. There's Lenny. You got Greg Jeffries with his family here. Dykstra's family's here. Doc Gooden with his ex-teammate in high school. Like old home week here in Candlestick in San Francisco. Terry Kennedy batting 231 takes a curveball low. Kennedy hitting 305 at Candlestick. Last year playing for Baltimore, he hit 176 at home. And 100 points higher on the road. This year, just the reverse. Hitting very well and in this ballpark, which is the toughest park for batting averages in the National League. Misses outside. Two balls and a strike to Kennedy. 
Baltimore still atop the American League East after losing their first 21 last year. Three balls and one strike to Terry Kennedy, who started his career with the St. Louis Cardinals. High and outside, so Cohn walks his first batter. And that'll bring up Jose Uribe. In the Elias Baseball Analyst, the book that's put out, an uh, outstanding book on stats, it said two catchers had four seasons at comparable points in their careers as Kennedy's. Frankie Hayes in 1946, and Frankie Hayes quit. The other was Tim McCarver in 1972. Tim McCarver went on to play for nearly another decade. Another eight years. Close That's just a way of Steve Hurt getting my name <laughs> in that book. I just wanted what a, what a devious I just, way. I, I mean, wanted to make sure that note. No, it came on good at the end. Oh, Started okay. out bad, but came <laughs> yeah, back I a little bit. I saw that note. Yeah. <laughs> well, Magan and holding Kennedy on. And I, for some inexpli or inexplicable reason, I think Kennedy, who has one stolen base this year, will check and see yes, how many. He has bored his major league career. Four lifetime, okay. Now, how can you be holding him on in this situation? The left-hand batter up? Yeah, come on. High and outside to Uribe. 2-0 to Jose. Uribe, a good day yesterday. Three for four. Kennedy has never stolen more than one base in his professional career, dating back to 19, from 1977. He has six professional stolen bases, so he has his limit this year, one. 3-0 to Uribe. I'll never forget the infield base hit that Uribe got off of Doc Gooden to stop his 14-game winning streak mm -hmm. right here in this ballpark. A high chopper. That was August 29th back in 1984 or 85. Drove in the winning run against Doc and he had won 14 straight games. A strike to Jose, three and one. One nothing Mets here in the bottom of the second. Windy candlestick in San Francisco. The second oldest ballpark in the National League. Fouled away. Three and two. All right. <laughs> Sir Galahad making the play for his lady friend. Kennedy running, and this one fouled out of play, so Terry will have to retreat to first. And another souvenir for the fans. Terry Kennedy, as you see, going back to first base, signed with the Cardinals. At that time, his father was the minor league director. And sure enough, he's traded to the Giants. His father's a minor league director with the Giants. Yeah, he was a good ball player. He had one of the great arms. Great arms, yeah, yeah, I heard that. A uh, high, so two straight walks by Cone. And David finding Kennedy at second, Uribe at first. And Mike Kruko the batter with two on, two out, one nothing New York here in the second. Kruko not a bad hitter for a pitcher. He's got a lifetime average of 193, but he's hit five home runs. ball towards short Johnson short hop throws out Kruko so the Giants fail to score here in the second after two it's one nothing New York we're back after this from the Hyatt hotels and resorts between innings Dana DeMuth the home plate umpire met with Mike Kruko and they gave added meaning to the term pull the strings as the strings were dangling from Kruko's glove and Dana made the trainer of the Giants cut the strings off the gloves the glove of Kruko so now we're ready to go here in the third one to nothing New York they scored after Dykstra walked he was balked to second in the first inning 
And then Tim Tuffle singled to drive in his fifth run of the year. Dykstra scoring easily, and Tuffle was thrown out at second base. Tim, so since that time, the Mets have gone down five in a row. You're too young to remember this, but pitchers at one time used to shred <laughs> their <laughs> shirts, and there'd be like ribbons on their pitching arm, and that would distract the batter. Huh. And at one time, they could do that, and then they put a rule in that said you can't do that anymore. Imagine that. Yeah, in other words, it, it was uh, spliced on the mm -hmm. end. And they it just like, them. Yeah. Huh. Looked like uh, the guy was pitching from behind the curtain, I guess. It's like a windmill. <laughs> yeah. Venetian blind. Uh, Eddie Stackey one time when they were pitching to a batter, was standing, he was a pull hitter, and they were, he was standing behind second, waving his arms up and down. They yeah, made I, him stop. Yeah, I remember that. Pearsall did it with Williams hitting, too, didn't he? Or oh. when, he, when he was traded later on? He could have. This one high to Sasser who is batting 276 his first three hit game of the year last Thursday Mackie Sasser one nothing New York inside ball two two and oh Sasser hit his first home run off Mike Kruko at Shea Stadium the only run that the Mets scored in Kruko's three to one win back on the 20th of May fly ball left field Kevin Mitchell one out Guy's a gutty competitor. And we've said it before, they're, they're, most major league players are competitors. You gotta be to reach this level of athletic achievement. But some players exude their athleticism and competitive spirit more than others. And here's a guy that does. And if you met him off the field, he's the most convivial guy you oh, ever yeah. want to meet. Real classy act. Another classy act. One hops one back to him, David Cohn. Seven in a row now, retired by Kruko. And two outs here in the third. Well, David remembers this park very well. Two years ago, on May 26th, Atley Hamaker pitching to David Cohn, and Cohn squared the bunt, and Hamaker's fastball nailed the pinky on David's right hand to the bat, and he missed three months of the season. Yeah, here's a guy who exudes that outward competitive drive. Glenn Dykstra, who scored the only run of the game. Fouled out of play, 0-1 to Lenny. <laughs> he and John Crook are about identical twins when it comes to Formaces and odd things that they do at the plate and on the field. Low ball one, one and one. A man of a thousand faces. Lon Chaney. <laughs> Another one fouled off, so Dykstra out in front of Kruko, but Kruko's out in front of Dykstra, one and two. <laughs> toward the giant dugout. Still a ball and two strikes to Lynn Dykstra. One to nothing here in the third. Mets over the Giants. Curve low. Good play, Kennedy. I say good play Kennedy even with nobody on you never know when you're going to get a check swing or something like that with two strikes. So as a catcher you complete the play. Also you build good habits. Yeah that's right. Two balls two strikes to Dykstra. Two outs here in the third. Grounder toward Clark at first. Three up, three down. That's eight in a row retired by Kruko, but the Mets have a one-nothing lead here in the middle of the third, and we're back. I guess you could say we slide into the bottom of the third after this from Texaco Haviland Motor Oil.
Hey, Mets fans, here's a great way to get into the starting lineup, the Kenner starting lineup. And on Saturday night, June 3rd, all fans 14 and under will receive one of your favorite Mets starting lineup action figures and a special starting lineup baseball card courtesy of Kenner and the Mets. Game time is 7.05. Tickets are available at all Ticketron outlets, Shea's advanced ticket window, or you can call 718-507-TIXX for more information. Mets baseball, excellence again and again. Well, Mets fans, the 1989 baseball season is about one-fourth into its full swing, and there's plenty of fun to be had at Shea this summer. Plenty of fun left. A record 27 promotional days highlight the schedule, courtesy of the Mets and their outstanding sponsors. Already, fans have received great items like Mets calendars, bags, shirts, and pitchers, and there's still much more fun to come. So order your tickets now. Tickets are available at all Ticketron outlets. Shay's advanced ticket window or call 718-507-TIXX for more information. Mets baseball, excellence again and again. And let's check out the National League Nissan scoreboard. Pittsburgh defeated Cincinnati 2-0. Cincinnati really struggling. They've now lost four in a row after winning four. And it's Chicago 3, Atlanta 2. So Chicago staying on top of that victory. Houston 2, St. Louis, pardon me, Houston 7, St. Louis 2 in the top of the ninth. The Dodgers leading Montreal 2 0, bottom half of the third, and San Diego leading Philadelphia 1 0, bottom half of the fifth. And here in San Francisco, Brett Butler leads it off. He flied out to left in the first inning, and another one lifted in the air. Second baseman Tim Tuffle makes the play. One pitch, one out here in the third. And on the American League Nissan scoreboard. It is Seattle three, the Yankees two, Oakland four, Boston two, Baltimore six, Texas two, top of the ninth. Cleveland beat Toronto six to two, bottom of the eighth inning, California three, Milwaukee nothing. Final score, Minnesota seven, Kansas City one, six to three. In the final game in the American League. 0-1 no to Robbie Thompson. Detroit beating the Chicago White Sox 6-3 in the top of the eighth. Line to left field, a base hit for Thompson. His second hit, and the Giants have only two. Robbie hit a good pitch. Curve ball down and away. Spanks it to left. He's at first with one out. He continues to hit the Mets well. He came in hitting 361 against the Mets in his major league career. And so far in this series, he's had four hits and seven at bats, and he hit a good breaking ball that was in a good spot. Will Clark lined to left. His first at bat. Thompson at first with one out, one to nothing Mets. Split fingers, swing and a miss, 0 and 1. Kevin Mitchell has given we talked to nicknames for Mitchell he's given Clark the nickname the Cape and the reason is he has such extension there's Kevin on deck throw to first Thompson diving back but the reason for that is Clark has such extension on his swing when he finishes his left hand appears to shroud his face like a cape in one of those old time horror movies. Kevin says Will looks like Count Dracula when he extends it. So the cape, it's 0-1, cone to the cape. Clark called timeout. I guess you could say he's been the cape of good hope for the Giants. Well, he's all their hope. He, he and Mitchell both. They are really tearing it up this year. Had a look at Bill Fahey, the third base coach for the Giants. Little looper, that's foul. Can Jeffries get to it? Nope, not enough hang time. So Clark 
in the hole 0 and 2 let's look at the swing of the cape see that left arm shrouding around that face he's got one of the real good swings in the National League look at that movement into the ball he was behind that one got jammed on that pitch but that follow through <laughs> going right on across the and there he is he's a cape offensively or defensively huh the cape but you can see with that swing there's such extension on his swings and that's why he meets a lot of balls out in front picture perfect swing of Will Clark ball and two strikes to Will Thompson at first one out one to nothing Mets here in the third there goes Thompson fastball is high the throw safe at second the throw was in time but it was offline and the diving Johnson a nice try by Hojo but Thompson has his fourth stolen base he is four for four in stolen bases and a good throw would have had him Sasser comes up throwing he has to throw over the left hand batter which is a difficult thing for a catcher to do and throw is offline otherwise they got wow him. I think they may have had him? him anyway I think he made the tag before the hand was in there we might have to look at that again Ralphie here it is again from this angle hard to tell whether he got any piece of his body but I think, base. That, I think that first shot showed a tag on the rear end right there yeah he got it yep little looper now Johnson over near second and the ball drops and Thompson and Temple colliding on the play I don't believe it that may go as a base hit how about that folks Well, the ball wasn't hit high enough for anybody to make an easy catch on it, and then it was in such a location that both the shortstop and second baseman had to try for it. Clark will get a base hit on it. And it will bring up Kevin Mitchell, while runners at first and second. Well, Johnson broke back and then in. Tuffle was not aggressive at all. And there's no way that ball should be dropping. But Clark has a base hit. Thompson stays at second. Mitchell with first and second. One out the throw to second, not in time. Kind of shades of the Billy Martin catch in the World Series against the Dodgers when nobody yeah. could get to it. Yeah. I think the 56 series. I believe Martin made the play and it was a big play in that game. Curb outside. One and oh to Mitchell who fly to center in the first inning. Has struck out one. He's walked two. He's given up three hits and has a one nothing lead here in the third. Fly ball deep to left field. Back is McReynolds. Dykstra back. Out of here. Home run. And Mitchell may have passed. Will Clark at first play at base. And believe me, I know that feeling. They're not calling it. Well, I'll tell you. Davey Johnson ought to appeal that play because I think he called it. There's no appeal, really. Here he comes. Yep. I think Kevin Mitchell passed Will Clark, who was tagging up at first base. I know. I say I know because I've done that before, and it's embarrassing. It was on July 4th, as a matter of fact. 1976. But it's a home run for, Mc for Mitchell as it stands now. Well, Davey coming out to argue with the first base umpire, a newcomer to the National League, Jerry Lane, and it doesn't appear that he's going to get a reversal on the decision. Well, anybody can call it now. It doesn't have to be the closest one. Here's what happened. Thompson went to tag up. Clark came back the first to tag up. Mitchell was watching the ball, and it was very close to passing Will Clark at first base. Well, he gets a fastball, and he really hits it because you're drilling that ball into the wind. High in the air, and it's fighting the wind all the way. Mitchell now at first base, and the ball out of the ballpark, and we couldn't tell whether or not he passed it. 
Mitchell did look back at the umpire to see whether or not it was going to be called. There That's he's a looking. dead giveaway right there. Yeah. You darn right. You can't pass the runner. And when you look back, why are you looking back? There's only one reason. Jeffrey's over near the tarp. And this ball lodging in the tarp. Ball not enough hang time again. So Mitchell with his 15th home run. And the Giants lead it 3-1. Now, had he passed Clark, what he would have been credited with would be a two-run single. Clark and Thompson would score, and Mitchell would be credited with a single. However, as it stands, a home run, 3-1 to one Giants. Line to center. Dykstra, two outs. That, by the way, the fifth home run given up by David Cohn this year. I mean, Mitchell put a charge in it. Roger Craig's got to be happy about that. Three to one, San Francisco. And here's Candy Maldonado. <laughs> Foul back out of play. Sasser giving chase to Novaya. No balls and a strike to Candy Maldonado. 47 RBIs now for Kevin Mitchell. Hmm. Up the middle, Howard Johnson throws out Maldonado, but damage was done. Here in the third inning, three runs, three hits, and the Giants take the lead three to one after three, and we're back after this from RC Cola. Well, the Giants leading by a score of three to one on Kevin Mitchell's home run, his fifth home run against the Mets in his major league career. And as we go to the top of the fourth inning, here is Steve Sabrisky. Thanks a lot, Ralphie. Tim Teffel leads it off for New York and takes a strike from Mike Fruko, who has beaten the Mets 21 times and has now staked to a 3 to 1 lead. Teffel had a base hit to drive in the Mets run with a single to left in the first inning. Strike two. Hit off the end of the bat, and Fruko makes the play, throwing out Temple for out number one. Nine in a row for Mike Kruko since giving up the base hit by Tuffle that drove in Lenny Dykstra in the first inning after Dykstra, Dykstra had walked and been balked to second. Now here's Howard Johnson, who popped out in foul territory his first time up. Ojo fourth in the National League in home runs, and you just saw the leader in the major leagues, Kevin Mitchell, hit his 15th. Line drive, base hit into center field, a one-out single for Hojo. And tonight's game is being brought to you from Candlestick Park, in part by Mita. All we make are great copiers. And by Tropicana. Pure premium home style. And as usual, the crowd comes alive when Daryl Strawberry comes to the plate. Straw struck out, swinging to end the first inning. And Johnson drawing a throw at first. Hojo coming to third, and he's going to be sent home. The throw gets away from the cutoff man, Thompson, and Johnson scores without a throw, and it's 3-2 to two, San Francisco. For Strawberry, his 27th RBI, and the 13th that he has driven in in the last 24 games. Maldonado goes into the corner to get this ball, and if he'd hit the cutoff man, it would have been very close at home, but he missed Thompson, the second baseman, and then there was no play on Johnson coming around to score. 
So Maldonado not executing correctly in the outfield. You saw the cutoff man jumping over the ball, trying to get to it, jumping up to it, and not able to get to it. Well, that really points out the importance of the outfielder just getting the ball to the cutoff man, even if a guy is trying to score, especially if a guy is trying to score. Kevin McReynolds grounded a second in the second, 0 for 1. Max still bothered by that sore thumb, and he's using that cutout rubber donut around it to try to cushion it a little bit. Big breaking ball for a strike. 0 and 2. Too high with a fastball, one ball, two strikes. I believe, Ralphie, this is the first time we've had heat in the broadcast booth here at Candlestick. How can you tell? <laughs> because usually I'm shivering, freezing in these night games. That's more than they have in the visiting dugout. Well, and I'll tell you what, the other thing that the guys complain about here is that the clubhouse is not attached to the dugout by a runway as in most most parks the way you get to the clubhouse here is go all the way down to the right field corner and the Mets are in the third base dugout so you can't run back in during the game and warm up at all you've got to stay there the high fastball gets McReynolds strikeout number two for Kruko and the second out here in the fourth inning hey, Kruko Kruko was figuring that Strawberry was relaying the pitches into the hitter there when they called that timeout and got together. Could, could, could be. <laughs> McReynolds struggling a bit of late, and here's Dave Magadan, who is not. Magadan has hit 405 over the, his last 13, 458 in the last seven to raise his average starting tonight to 304. A number out in front of the mound. Kruko barehands it and throws him out at first and the inning is over. But the Mets pick up a run on two hits here in the fourth and after three and a half, it's three to two San Francisco. Back after this for Mita Copiers. Terry Kennedy leads off the bottom of the fourth for San Francisco. He fouled the first pitch off for strike one. Mackie Sasser appeared to get something in his eye. And Dana DeMuth, the home plate umpire, asking him if he's all right. Might be a hot dog wrapper. <laughs> They're blowing all over the place as usual. On the inside corner, two strikes to Kennedy, who walked his first time up. Three to two, San Francisco in the bottom of the fourth inning. Ball over the outside corner as Cone picks up his second strikeout. One out in the fourth. And that'll bring up Jose Uribe, who also walked in the second inning. Jose Uribe Gonzalez. He dropped the Gonzalez. Check out the pant legs on the third base umpire, Terry Tate. Strike one. This win will take the crease right out of your pants. Yeah, right out of your legs, too. We were talking during the commercial that for a while the flags in center field will be blowing in one direction. It's just out there as stiff as a board, and then a minute later they're blowing the opposite direction. Uribe reaches out and laces one down the right field line. Strawberry over to get it, and Uribe racing to second with a double. Hit number five for San Francisco, and Uribe at second with one out. Uribe now four for five against the Mets in this series. Had three hits in yesterday's ball game. He also walked his first time up, so. He's got that stroke down pretty well. 
is Mike Kruko, who holds up on the low pitch for ball one. Kruko grounded the short descent to end the second inning. Mike is just one for 13 this year. That is well below his norm. And Cone bounces one up there, and Sansa makes a good play for ball two. Giants taking over first place when they won yesterday, and they got a chance to pick up another full game on Cincinnati tonight. It'll be two up if they win tonight, Cincinnati losing. Foul outside of third. In the National League East, the Cubs lost. They are leading with the Mets now in third place. Two and a half games back. Chicago lost three to two to Atlanta. The Braves beat them in so. Right now, the Mets are two games behind the Cubs pending the outcome of this game. Strike call on the outside corner, two and two. One out, one on in the bottom of the fourth inning. The Giants leading the Mets three to two. High fastball gets Kuko. Cone has struck out three, two of them here in the fourth inning. Cohn now at 57 strikeouts. Last year he was second to Nolan Ryan in strikeouts with a record of 20 and three. And a good fastball right there sends Kruko back to the warmth of the dugout. They have heaters in the giant dugout, but not in the Mets. I think this whole thing is by design. Making the visiting club stay out here all the time and not have any heaters. Why not take advantage of your home field advantages? Now the hot dog wrappers are really getting on the field as Brett Butler stands in. Butler's 0 for 2. He has flied to shallow left and popped out to second. Strike one. There go some wrappers. That must have been a foot long hot dog. That thing was wrapped. That must have been a two foot hot dog. One of those Polish hot dogs they have here. Oh, they're good. Polish sauce tastes good, but it'll kill you. <laughs> Butler hits it well to right. Strawberry on the run. He won't get it. It's in the gap. Uribe comes in to score. Butler's going to third. And he'll get in a trip with a triple standing up. The Giants lead it. Four to two. Well, Butler, one of two players in Major League history to lead both legs in three base hits. The other was Sam Crawford. And right here he gets his first three base hit of this year. And there's no contest. So Butler at third with two out, a run in, and Robbie Thompson, who is two for two, stands in there. The breaking ball is way outside for ball one. Thompson just keeps wearing out the Mets. If he hit against the rest of the league like he did against New York, he'd win the batting title every year. Slider high and away, two balls, no strikes. As you pointed out, Ralphie, he started the night with a career 361 average against the Mets, and he's two for two in this game. Did he hold up? Yes, he did, says the first base umpire, Jerry Lane. And a good play by Sasser to save a run as he dug that one out. Sasser had to go about three or four feet to the right of home plate to make the play. Cohn has made four wild pitches so far this year. Sasser saves him the fifth one. And the run. Ball four. So Thompson goes to first. Mel Stoblemeyer goes to the mound. Third walk issued by Cohn. Thompson's been on base all three times, and Roger Craig is coming out of the Giants' dugout to have a chat with the home plate umpire, Dana DeMoot. Yeah, I think he's with his hands. He's demonstrating to Dana DeMoot that he doesn't think that Cohn is coming to a complete and discernible stop. Well, Whatever Mets, that is. <laughs> yeah, the Mets' first run was set up by a balk by Kruko. 
Cohen has balked once this year. And Roger Craig, who was a pitcher, as a matter of fact, the number one pitcher for the Mets back in 1962. And it was the balk that cost Roger McDowell the game in Los Angeles in the 12th inning. So first and third with two out for Will the Thrill, who is one for two. He is lined to left at an infield base hit on a ball that should have been caught and later scored ahead of Mitchell's home run. Bunning for a hit, he fouls it off for strike one. Well, the Mets playing deep against Clark, set up for the double play. He's a tough man to double up because he gets down that line in spite of his size in a good hurry. And he was trying to take advantage of Greg Jeffries playing at that deep position at third. And he was hoping to get the run in. So Bill Fahey will go through the signs again. Butler with great speed at third. Thompson at first. He said the Mets were set up for double play. There are two out. They're set up for the defense against the one out. Another good play by Sasser. One ball, one strike. Four to two San Francisco in the bottom of the fourth inning. Just outside two and one. Will Clark is the only giant to ever play in 162 games in the season. Dating back to the beginning of the Giants in New York. Popped up going back out of play behind home plate. Mackey gives it a look. And properly, he does not give up on the ball because in this ballpark, particularly, a ball may look as if it's going to be a half a dozen rows back in the seats. And when it gets up there, the wind will bring it right back in your lap. Well, you surely don't give up on anything in the air in this ballpark because anything could happen. That ball could come back. It did come back about six rows, actually. Mackey was open and come back about five more. Low and away to Clark. So the count is three and two. Thompson will be running from first with the pitch as Magadan will now move behind him. Thompson takes off and it's ball four. The bases are loaded. Well, Will Clark works out the walk. He led the National League in walks last year. Davey Johnson is saying something to the home plate umpire, Dana DeMuth. No one throwing in the bullpen for the Mets. And things have really been going against the Mets on this homestand. I should say road trip. is loaded and the number one home run hitter in Major League Baseball Kevin Mitchell in there who has hit a three run home run already tonight in the last inning his 15th of the year slider high for ball one Brett Butler is at third base Robbie Thompson now at second and Will Clark at first two out the Giants have already scored one here in the fourth. Mitchell rips it foul past Bill Fahey, and now there is activity as Terry Leach and Don Ossie both start to loosen up in the New York bullpen. One and one to Mitchell. Kevin Mitchell leads the National League in slugging percentage at 643. And he tacked a little bit onto that so far tonight. The Laredo is outside. Mitchell went too far, they say, and he's out of there. And the inning is over. But the Giants score a run on two hits, and they leave the bases loaded. They lead. Four to two at the end of four. And we're back to the stick after this for Budweiser.
Mel Stottlemyre with words of consolation for David Cohn in the Mets dugout as Greg Jeffries leads off the fifth inning with the Giants leading the Mets four to two. Jeffries 0 for 1 grounded to short his first time up and he takes inside ball one. High but foul down the right field line and Maldonado into the corner can't quite get to it. So it's one ball one strike. So we'll tell you right now that this copyrighted telecast is authorized under television rights granted by the New York Mets solely for the entertainment of our audience publication reproduction or the use of the pictures descriptions and accounts of this game without the written consent of the New York Mets Sterling Doubleday Enterprises and the WWOR TV is prohibited any commercial or other use of the program such as by charging admission for its showing is similarly prohibited. So please pay your two dollars at the door. Jeffrey skies another one down the right side and this one going back into the seat for strike two. One and two. Davey Johnson held a State of the Union address to the media, the New York beat writers today. And one of the things he said was that he felt that Greg Jeffries had been unfairly criticized for the slow start given the fact that no one else on the Mets is hitting particularly well either. This ball rolls foul and Kruko <laughs> diving trying to get it before it went foul and before Jeffries went by. Good idea. That was a good try. We are talking about him being a competitor right here. He does everything he can do to try and get the call. Makes the slide to get to the ball so he can feel it. But it was clearly foul. <laughs> <laughs> nice try, Mike. What a guy. What a great guy. Well, anyway, you know, Davey said, look, Jeffries has 15 RBIs. McReynolds has 18 RBIs, only three more. And nobody else to speak of, maybe with the exception of Howard Johnson so far, has hit that well. This ball grounded. Knocked down by Thompson, but he has no play at first. It'll be a base hit for Greg Jeffries. You're right there. When you look at the whole ball club, Jeffries isn't the one to blame. It's a team effort. Other than Howard Johnson, no one's really been getting any clutch hits to speak of. And you look at Thompson here trying to take that base hit away from Jeffries. But it'll go as a base hit. Good try by Thompson, who has not made an error at second base in 61 games. The other thing that Davey told the writers was that for the time being anyway the ball club situation is going to be status quo don't expect any big changes or big moves even though the Mets are struggling Mackie Sasser hacking as usual hacks at one and fouls it back for strike one Sasser fly deep to left his first time up well, these players got the Mets to be the type of ball club they are winning over 90 games every year that Johnson's been the manager and you're certainly not going to give up on them because if you press that panic button and start making trades you can get into deep trouble. Well they obviously know that this club has talent. They've just got to find a way to unleash it and kickstart things offensively. John or Jeffrey's running and Sasser fouls it back again. So it's 0 and 2 to Mackey and Jeffrey's back to first. Jeffrey's at first with nobody out in the top of the fifth inning. San Francisco leading New York. Four to two. If you remember last year, the Mets got off to that good start, and then for a period of 81 games, they played 500 ball, and there were a lot of people trying to bury the club then, and they went on to win 100. Just about the same type ball club they got out here right now. <laughs> got to play the cards that are dealt. Dance with who brung you? Jeffrey's running again. Sasser. Right over to Uribe, who knocks it down. Can't make a play, however. He does prevent Jeffries from going to third on the hit and run. So a good reaction by Uribe, who was breaking to second, to come back and at least stop the ball. It'll be a base hit for Sasser. And yeah, we're going to have a pinch hitter for David Cohn with the Mets a chance to get back in this ball game. They're trailing by a score of four to two. Five hits now for New York. Two infield hits here in the fifth. 
Don Ossie has sat down, but Terry Leach appears to be ready as he has continued to warm up with Greg Pavlik guarding him. Where the pitcher stands here for both clubs, a bullpen is really almost in the field of play. And a foul ball down that line can be dangerous. You can see where Greg Pavlik is standing with the glove on. He's just a few feet from the foul line. And he's there to protect Terry Leach while he warms up. Lee Mazzilli will pinch it for David Cohn. Mass batting an even 100. He's two for 13 as a pinch hitter, and one of those hits a three run home run that got the Mets into first place in a turnaround. They were in last place six games back when he hit that home run off Bedrosian of the Phillies. The Mets came on to get back to first and then have dropped down to third on this road trip. But even though June is looming on the horizon, the Mets are only now, after Chicago's loss today, two games back. And you're right, Rafi. It's you know you can't say it's early forever, but it's still too early to panic as far as the Mets are concerned. Maz, it's a sharp ground ball to first. Clark will go to Ribe for one. Kuko covering for the double play, and Jeffries will be at third now with two out. And that Giants defense continues to sparkle. That is their league-leading 54th double play. This ball is hit hard by Lee Mazzelli, but right at Clark, who turns it into a double play. All you can hope when you're a batter is to hit the ball on the good part of the bat and hit it hard. Unfortunately, it was right at Clark as far as Mazzelli is concerned, and the double play. Look at Aribe get rid of that ball in a hurry without even taking a step. And Mazzilli's not even in the picture. And Maz runs well. So here's Dykstra and he lines a base hit into the gap in left center field. Jeffrey scores. Butler cuts the ball off and here goes Dykstra for second. He's out of there. But the Mets get a run here in the fifth inning to push it back to a one run game as the Giants lead four to three in the middle of the fifth and we're back after this for the Bell Atlantic Yellow Pages. <laughs> Terry Leach into the game as he replaces David Cohn. David Cohn pitching five innings four innings rather so David leaving the game down by one run as he gives up all four runs on six hits he struck out three and uncharacteristically he walked four and, but David this year has had a problem more so than last year walking batters there you see Terry's numbers and they have been good he has had a remarkable stint with the New York Mets after being released more than once what a record he's turned in for New York and he's in here in middle relief again and in the middle innings once again Ralph Kiner and it will be Ernest Riles to lead off against Leach Riles has twice flied out to the center fielder Lenny Dykstra and Leach with his first pitch a called strike Riles last year in 79 games with the Giants at 294 with three home runs. He's hit 333 against the Mets, and that ball grounded foul strike two. In 1987, Terry Leach was 11 and 1 for the Mets in 44 games. In 1988, 7 and 2. He has won 18 and lost three ball games for the Mets in his last two years. And again a foul ball so the count stays at strike two. Leach in night games has a record of 20 and zero. Baby. Tough to see that little humpback <laughs> sinker isn't it? <laughs> That's an amazing record in day games he's four and nine. He's pitched 366 innings coming into this season without making a wild pitch. So Terry a man who was released twice by the Atlanta Braves organization 
traded by the Mets one time and back with the Mets and doing a fantastic job as a part time starter and middle relief man and that pitch a ball in the count two balls and two strikes. Carries in a role that doesn't get a lot of publicity and he doesn't get a lot of credit but boy, when you have a guy who can come in in the middle innings and keep you in the ball game and give your club a chance to come back you got a valuable pitcher. And Riles files off a fastball and the count stays at two balls and two strikes. David Cohen had good stuff tonight. He didn't pitch that badly. Mitchell's three run home run in the third the big blow against him and Tony only goes four. So Leach working to his first batter with a 2 2 count as we follow the action in the bottom half of the fifth inning another foul ball. Riles hit the 10,000th home run hit by Giants player players in their history last year who hit the first. <laughs> we'll have to ask him. <laughs> That was about a hundred years ago. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> Count remains at two balls and two strikes. Were the Giants the first club to hit the 10,000 mark in team home runs? That's a pretty good question. I, I don't know the answer to I that. I think they were. Maybe the Yankees. They well, had some big home that's run true. hitters. Maybe the days. Giants in the National League. Maybe that's what I heard. Is they were in the National League. Kind of an odd stat. Got yeah. to do a lot of counting. I'll <laughs> say that. Imagine going through the research of that one. No thanks. <laughs> it's one of those who really cares deal. Willie Mays was 660 home runs, but of course not all those were the Giants. Ended up his career with the New York Mets. Ground ball toward third. It'll be a base hit. So Ernest Ryle. Leads off against Leach with a single to left field. Roger Craig really likes Ernest Riles. He thinks that this guy is going to fill a gap in his ball club that he's needed to have filled. He doesn't want Kevin Mitchell to have to play third. He wants Mitchell to play left field. And in years past, in Mitchell's brief career with the Giants, he's been forced to play third. And Ernest Riles, Roger Craig feels, is going to be a piece of the puzzle. To keep the Giants a contender. And the base hit brings up Candy Maldonado, and Candy 0 for 2, and he takes the first pitch for ball one. Riles was acquired from Milwaukee for Jeff Leonard. Or we should say Jeffrey Leonard. Yes, please. One ball, no strikes. Leach back and a ground ball to third could be a double play. Jeffries to Tuffle on the first base to Magadan and the Mets turn their first double play of the game. Aldonado really has become the target of the Bluebirds here in San Francisco after having a couple of great years for the Giants. Well, Candy now has only had two hits in his last 18 times up. He has really struggled this year. He entered this game hitting 189. He's 0 for 3 tonight. So he's probably down around 185 or 186 now on the year. And to hit into a double play when you're two for your last 18 is adding insult to injury. And that'll bring up Terry Kennedy, who has walked and struck out, and he lines one in the right center field for extra bases. Kennedy on his way to second. Dykstra now picking the ball up and getting it back into the cutoff man. And Kennedy with a stand up double. Kennedy's seventh two base hit of the year. Kennedy hits a pretty darn good pitch right there, down and away. And he hits it with authority. The quintessential tweener right here, and it takes a funny hop off the fence. Kennedy, when he saw that ball kick off the fence, you saw him look at Bill Fahey, the third base coach, and say, what am I doing? And Bill Fahey, with two out, 
And the Giants with the lead says you're staying right there at second base. Especially with a hot Jose Uribe coming up. Uribe has had four hits and five at bats against the Mets in this series. In this game, he has walked and doubled. Pitcher behind him, and the Mets have the option of walking Uribe here. They're going to pitch to him. And he grounds this one down to the first baseman Magadan, and that will do it. One hit, a double play, and then a double, and one man left on base. So in the inning, no runs on two hits. And the score at the end of five innings here at Candlestick, it's the Giants four and the New York Mets three. Now here's a word from Virgin Atlantic Airlines. Well, the Giants leading by a score of four to three as we go to the top of the sixth inning. That's what I call a bundle of joy right there, and it is bundled up appropriately. Appropriately is correct. And for the Mets, it'll be Tim Tuffle to lead it off. Tuffle drove in a run in the first inning with a single that he tried to stretch into a double and was thrown out. Mets have had two runners thrown out trying to stretch singles into doubles in this game. Tuffle came, his came with no one out. And a big play in the game. The last was Dykstra, who did it with two men out, and a good gamble by Dykstra with two men out. He questioned whether Tuffle's gamble was that good as he became the first out of the inning when he didn't make it. But Mitchell really did make a good play on him. Yeah, and great Tuffle's play. defense. I mean, it, it really took a, a fine play by Kevin to get him. And Kevin made it. What a year Mitch is having. Mitch, the offensive star of this game with a three-run home run and also a fine defensive play. Played for the Mets in the 1986 season and, of course, scored the time run in that B game against the Boston Red Sox when the Mets came back to win it with three runs in the 10th inning on the ground ball that Buckner didn't field at first base hit by Mookie Wilson. Mitchell came in on the wild pitch when Mookie was at the plate and scored the time run. He contributed a big hit in that inning. He contributed a lot throughout the entire season. Three and two to Tuffle. The Mets need one to tie, so Tuffle trying to work his way on against Mike Kruko. And he does. So the leadoff batter walks here in the sixth inning. And that's only the second walk Kruko has given up today. He walked Dykstra to lead off the ball game. And the walk brings up Howard Johnson, who has a base hit and two at bats with a run score. And with that walk. To Tuffle to lead off the inning. The bullpen stirring down in right field for the San Francisco Giants. <laughs> Mets don't figure to be bunning here, and the first pitch to Johnson foul back out of play. Brantley, the right hander, and Hammaker, the left hander, throwing for the Giants. Giants with four runs on eight hits. The Mets have three runs on six. Mets trying to stop a three game losing streak. The Giants have won four in a row. And the toss over to first. Tuffle with 10 stolen bases in his major league career. And he draws more throws than anybody else. He and Mackinson. <laughs> One strike to count to Howard Johnson. And he takes a breaking ball for a ball that's one and one. I understand we have another late night edition of Kiner's Corner this evening, Mr. Kiner. Very late. Very late. Well, I want you to know that we've arranged for a satellite hookup from Los Angeles. Ricky Horton is standing by. We're going to make Ricky Horton available in case you want to use him tonight. He might be able to take the shuttle up here and be <laughs> here in time. Let's get him on the phone. Get Ricky Horton up here for Kiner's Corner. Get a satellite hookup or something going. He's available now. I just want you to keep that in mind. He's been available for about eight years. <laughs> That's right. 
so so he reminds you regularly. At least he reminds us. I don't know. We're we're now campaigning on his behalf. Two balls, one strike to count. Runner goes, and the ball is hit in the air. It's playable. Couple has to stop. He retreats back toward first base as Butler makes the catch. So the Mets put Tuffle in motion and the fly ball for the first out. He you know, there's only one thing better than the Mets win and that's celebrating that win with a nice cold Budweiser. Mets fans this Bud's for you. One away a runner at first base the Mets need one to tie two to go in front and the batter is Daryl Strawberry. Daryl doubled the drive and a run back in the fourth inning. He is three for five in this series. And he takes the first pitch for ball one. Strawberry has hit two home runs off of Kruko in his major league career, but hitting only 154 against him coming into this game. He's hit 12 home runs against the Giants in his career. And now Roger Craig coming out of the dugout. He's got a left hander Hammaker warming up on the bullpen. He might want to make a switch here. Kruko came into this game with a record of three and two and one of the wins against the Mets. He's won 21 games against the Mets and lost only seven in his major league career. Yep, Rogers going to make the change. He just signaled for Hammaker to come into the game. And Mike Kruko pitching in the sixth inning stands to be the winning pitcher. Provided the Giants hold on to this lead. So while the pitcher comes in to warm up, here's a word from Texaco Haveline Motor Oil. Atlee Hammaker, who once was a member of the San Francisco starting rotation, now a reliever making his 18th appearance of the year. Of course, he's had both the rotator cuff and Bone spur is removed from his elbow, so maybe not the pitcher he once was. Nine and nine last year with five saves for San Francisco. This year he comes into the game with a record of four and three with no saves. This will be his 17th game. He's made two game starts and he misses with his first pitch, and that's ball two. Kruko had worked the count to one ball, no strikes on Strawberry before the change. And that pitch for ball three. Last home run by a left hand batter hit against Hammaker was hit by Daryl Strawberry. That was back on May 27th, 1987. He has given up 32 home runs since then, all by right hand batters. Three balls, no strikes. And Strawberry taking all the way. It's ball four. I don't understand why Darrell would be looking for the walk there. I don't either. The pitch was out of the strike zone, but you would think that Darrell. He wasn't even about ready to swing. He nope. was going to take the pitch no matter what. That's right. You'd and think, a home run would put the Mets in front. You'd think he would be looking to hack if it was in the zone, but he made no movement on the ball whatsoever. Darrell standing flat footed all the way. So he gets a walk and now the right hand batter Kevin McReynolds up with the time run at second base to go ahead run at first. McReynolds 0 for 2 and he takes a strike. So Roger Craig making the switch to the left hand pitcher to pitch to the left hand batter. Now he has the right handers coming up. One strike the count to Kevin McReynolds. And a ball call, so it's one ball and one strike. McReynolds 0 for 6 in the two games of this series at this point, hitting 274 before the start of this game with five home runs, 18 runs batted in. 
fly ball hit to right field. Maldonado, the right fielder in right center. And he makes the catch. Tuffle back to second base. Strawberry back to first. And that'll bring up Dave Magadan, a left-hand batter. Magadan, as a left-hand batter against the left-hand pitcher, is an outstanding hitter if you check out the stats. Coming into this year, David, number one in Major League Baseball as a left-handed hitter against left-handed pitching. Checking out the last 14 years, he's number one. Mike Greenwald is number two, and Tony Gwynn is number three. And Wade Boggs, number four, against left-hand pitchers as a left-hand batter. So Magadan has hit left-hand pitching very well. Oh for two tonight, one for six in this series. The Mets with a time run at second. We're in the top of the sixth inning with two men out. And he hits one to left field. Mitchell coming over is right there, and he makes the catch. And the Mets threaten on two walks and don't score. As they lead to one in scoring position and the score at the end of five and a half innings the Giants four, the Mets three now here's a word from the United Parcel Service. Bottom half of the sixth inning the Giants leading by a score of four to three. And for the Giants. Hammaker will be the leadoff batter. Adley Hammaker will lead it off, and the first pitch is taken for ball one. Terry Leach on the mound. Terry coming into this game to work the fifth inning in place of David Cohn. A strike call, one ball, one strike. Hammaker has been up eight times so far this year with three hits and a swing and a miss and it's one and two. You'd never know it from that swing. No. But that's a pretty hefty average. Albeit very few at bats. The one two pitch to Hammaker topped out foul and it will be a holding count at one ball and two strikes. All of Hammaker's base hits have been singles, three for eight. Giants with four runs on eight hits. The Mets have three runs on six. And the big hit so far in this game, the three-run home run by Kevin Mitchell back in the third inning. His 15th home run of the year and 45, 46, and 47th RBIs. When Hammaker came up to the Giants from Phoenix in 1982, he was 12 and 8. And the next year, 83, 10 and 9. Then he went under the knife for the uh, rotator cuff surgery at the end of the 83 season. Since then, his best year was 87 when he was 10 and 10. And then, as you mentioned, Ralph, he was 9 and 9 last year. Had that surgery back in 1986 for the rotator cuff. Same type of surgery that Roger Clements had. And then later in the same year, he had surgery on his left knee. And the fastball fouled off. So he's had shoulder, elbow, and knee surgery all since 1983. Yeah, in 84, he had surgery for the rotator cuff prior to the season. season and then again that same year, surgery on his elbow for those bone spurs so he's been under the knife a few times stays alive as he grounds that ball foul one and two and I guess for those reasons as much as any other he's never been able to fulfill the promise that the Giants saw in him in 82 he was originally with Kansas City and they got him from Kansas City and after that first season they thought he was really going to be a great starting pitcher and this one hit down the line in right field. Another base hit for Hammaker. Strawberry over to field it. Hammaker on his way to second. 
The throw in by Strawberry, not in time, and Hammaker with his fourth hit of the year. Maybe that first swing was a decoy. I mean, <laughs> you ought to be smiling, Atley. He slices this ball down the right field line. Not exactly your Spalding guide swing, but it's effective, especially when you're four for nine on the year. His first extra base hit, and Strawberry almost gets him. If Darrell's throw had been to the second base or the infield side of second base, Atley might have been out. David Johnson's out, and I think, well, look at this. Sid Fernandez from the bullpen. As Terry Leach is going to be out. So with Brett Butler, left-hand batter coming up, they're going to the left-hand pitcher, Sid Fernandez, in relief. And while he comes in to take his warm-up pitches, here's a word from Tropicana. Terry Leach leaves after one inning, plus one hitter here in the sixth inning. And the double by the leadoff batter pitcher, Atley Hammaker, chases him in favor of Sid Fernandez, who is making his third relief appearance of the year. Sid's first two appearances this season were as a reliever. Then came a string of starts broken only by this relief appearance. And Sid is still scheduled to pitch on Sunday in New York against the Pirates. But because of the off day, ostensibly a travel day, although the Mets will fly all of Wednesday night rather than on the day Thursday uh, allocated for that. Well, Sid, Sid is, is getting in the game tonight. Sid has done a good job as a relief pitcher back in 86 in the All-Star game. He walked Puckett and Lloyd Mosby and then struck out Brooke Jacoby, Jim Rice, and Don Mattingly in relief. And then in the World Series, he was brilliant in relief. Game five, he pitched four shutout innings, gave up only three hits and struck out five. And gave game seven, he gave up a hit to Wade Boggs and then retired seven straight, striking out four. So Sid has been used in relief a few times, and he has done very well. You saw Bud Harrelson signaling to the Mets defense, as Brett Butler will be the batter, that uh, Hammaker has a bad knee and doesn't run that well. And Butler, who is an outstanding bunter for base hits, he's had nine bunt base hits this year in a bunting position here for the sacrifice. He tripled back in the fourth inning to drive in a run. Had two RBIs on sacrifice flies yesterday. Jeffries, the third baseman, looking for the bunt. It's bunted perfectly down to first. He'll have to hurry to get him. The throw is not in time. And a good play on the bad throw by Tuffle to keep the ball in the infield. So that'll be a bunt for a base hit. And Hammaker moves to third. This is the 10th bunt base hit of the season for Brett Butler. Last year, he was number one in the National League with a total of 20. And this is just perfect. Look how that ball dies right near the line. And all Jeffries can do is throw it as hard as he can, and Tuffle saves him an error and saves the Mets a run. By diving for this ball, Jeffries charges and fires it, and Tuffle has to leap across the line to keep Hammaker at third and the ball in the ball game. So the Giants leading four to three and threatening with runners at first and third and no one out here in the bottom half of the sixth and the first pitch by Fernandez swung on and fouled back a fastball fouled off. And that pitch that foul ball tore the mask off of home plate umpire Dana DeMuth. Bill Fahey the third base coach Thompson in this game two for two with a walk so he's been perfect. And he's a tough man to strike out. One strike to count. And the pitch back again, the fastball again, foul back, strike two. Thompson, not only a tough guy to strike out for the Mets, he's a tough guy to get out. Came into this game hitting 361 lifetime against the Mets. Collins, a runner. Should say Butler, the runner first, has good speed. And there's a swing and a miss and a big strikeout at this point for Sid Fernandez as he strikes out a tough contact hitter. El Sid reaching back for a little extra and just blows it right by him. 
Thompson can't believe that he strikes out. Watch this. Where'd that ball go? Geez, I can't believe that. And he hardly ever does strike out, especially against New York. And that'll bring up Will Clark, the National League's leading batter. Clark in this game, one for two with a walk. Looped the base hit, an infield base hit that dropped near second base, and he takes the first pitch for ball one. Clark hitting 363 to lead the National League in hitting. He is number one in hits with 66. That's set up for the double play and the pitch back to Clark is in there for a called strike. That's set up for the double play. Sid Fernandez is not a ground ball pitcher. Most of his outs are in the air, but he also strikes out a lot of batters. One ball, one strike, and a toss over to first base. And the pitch back hit deep to right field. If it's fair, it's gone. It is a fair ball. Another three-run home run for the Giants. And they lead it by a score of seven to three. thrill gives him a thrill here at candlestick with his 10th home run of the year and the cape really put it on this pitch sending it well out of the park he now has 42 RBIs second to teammate Kevin Mitchell who had a three run home run of his own back in the third inning and Mitchell's at the plate again second three run home run Mitchell with a three run home run in the third the Giants on top seven to three and the curveball over a called strike Giants now with seven runs on 11 hits and leading seven to three and Mitchell pops it up Tuffle the second baseman making the call and he fights it off and makes the catch. So two men away. And that'll bring up Ernie Riles. We mentioned earlier that Ernie Riles hit the 10,000th home run by a Giants player. And we have gotten the clarification, Mr. Kiner. One of our cast of a thousand here in the booth. Mr. Gary Williams tracked down the Giants PR and found out the real story. And the first pitch to Riles, a fastball for a ball. The Giants were the first National League team to have 10,000 home runs. The Yankees were the first team in baseball to do it, as we suspected. And the uh, Giants also this year had their 10,000th stolen base as a team and they were the sixth team to do that but they were the first team in the major leagues to have 10,000 home runs and 10,000 stolen bases so they had a couple of firsts one of them having to do with Ernie Riles and the other one coming on a stolen base this year and the pitch back by Sid Fernandez a ball call so it's two balls and one strike. Riles in this game with a base hit and three times up. Base hit coming off of Terry Leach. And the fastball hit foul down the left side. You saw Roger McDowell walking to the bullpen and Roger starting to loosen up for the Mets. There he is. One of the runs scored in this inning will go against Leach's record. The other two against Sid Fernandez. And at 2 2, 
Another foul ball hit down the left side. Well, I'll tell you, Mitchell and Clark, or if you want to do it in the order in which they hit, Clark and Mitchell, an awesome duo for the Giants this year, and absolutely the reason, overriding reason, that they are in first place in the West. And that pitch a ball, and it's three balls and two strikes. Mitchell with 15 home runs, Clark with 10 home runs, Mitchell with 47 runs batted in, Clark with 42. They're 1 2 in those departments. And the Giants lead the National League a run scored. Fly ball to left center. Over there is Dykstra. And he makes the catch, and that retires the side. But three runs on the three run home run by Will Clark. They had three hits, no one left on base. The score at the end of six. As Tim McCarver joins Steve Sabrisky, it's the Giants seven and the New York Mets three. And here's a word from the Bell Atlantic Yellow Pages. Well, they're boogieing in the San Francisco here at the stick tonight. Those guys aren't cold, and neither are the San Francisco Giants. As they now lead seven to three, a three-run home run by Kevin Mitchell in the third, and a three-run home run by Will Clark in the sixth. So why not have a Sears financial update? Makes sense to me. Anyway, here's what the market did on Tuesday, and it was down over 18 points. And as we go to the uh, seventh inning, that's the look at the financial update brought to you by Sears. Here's Tim McCarver. All right, thanks a lot, Steve Zabrisky. Oh. Act like we just met. <laughs> And it's one and one to Greg Jeffries. I wonder if there are a few more things we could try to cram in here before we go to a pitch or two. Well, I'll tell you, the Mets would like to cram in some runs. They trail seven to three here in the seventh. Clark, a long run, and he overran it. And that's easy to do with windswept candlestick. All you can do on a ball, no matter how it's hit, as long as it's in the air here, is go take a chance. Go where you think it's going to be. Hot luck. Yep. And it's hard to be right very often. <laughs> this is a tough play even when the wind isn't blowing because the ball doesn't have much hang time. And either a first or third baseman has to really hustle over there. And you just got to pick a spot and go to it in a hurry. That was almost a sure stop by Will Clark. It's a ball and two strikes. There's Brett Butler going back. And he makes the play. So Brett Butler makes a nice play. One out here in the seventh inning, seven to three San Francisco, and Mackie Sasser the batter. Mackie one for two, an infield hit in the fifth inning. And if you're wondering why Mackie is batting against a left-handed pitcher, the Mets trail by four. You don't want to pinch hit someone right now and make the change when you're trailing by four. You'd much rather do it when you're trailing by one or if a couple of guys were on that's when you would bring in Barry Lyons but not now and Mackey takes a strike Mackey's been hot lately six hits in his last nine at bats including a one for two tonight grounded towards second Robbie Thompson two outs Mookie Wilson is going to be the pinch hitter for Sid Fernandez. So it's been David Cohn who went four innings, Terry Leach who went one plus, and Sid Fernandez who finished off the sixth, but in the process gave up a home run to Will Clark, a three run dinger, his tenth of the year. Mookie Wilson, the batter. Two out, nobody on, seven to three San Francisco. Mookie's two for nine as a pinch hitter with one pinch hit RBI. Oh. Slider for a strike from Atlee Hamaker, who entered the game in the sixth inning. Mike Kruko, the pitcher of record. And should the Mets lose without regaining the lead, David Cohn will take his fourth loss. Fastball low, one and one. Cued 
foul. A ball and two strikes to Wilson. The Mets two and five on this road trip. They have lost two games two to one, two games three to two, and one game four to three. In those five losses, they have scored nine runs. And they've only scored three here tonight so far. One at a time. Lined foul into the heavily clothed crowd here at Candlestick. <laughs> at least they got some padding on in <laughs> yeah, case right. it gets them. Well, you know, the, the Mets used to be the kind of club that could put together the big inning, and they could come back, and they could rally, and they could score three, four, five runs at a time. They haven't done that this year. There have been a lot of picket fences out there. One run here and one run there. And Wilson down on strikes. First strikeout for Adley Hamaker. The Mets go on order in the seventh. It's seven to three, San Francisco, after six and a half. And we speed into the seventh. After this from Nissan. Follow all the action this season with the 1989 New York Mets yearbook. It's filled with spectacular photos and features a special 32-page tribute to the 1969 world champions. Pick up your Mets yearbook at Shea Stadium or send a check or money order made payable to the New York Mets for $5 plus $2. Postage and handling to Mets yearbook, post office box 9559. Trenton, New Jersey, 08650. Please allow four to six weeks for delivery. New Jersey residents add 6% sales tax. Well, it may not be the perfect time or the evening or the place for a beach towel. Of course, you could go about 15 minutes from here and use one, but not at the stick. However, thanks to you fans in New York, MetLife Beach Towel Day on Sunday, June 4th is a complete sellout. However, tickets are still available for the first two games of the series against Jim Leland's Pittsburgh Pirates on Friday, June 2nd. That's at 7.35. And on Saturday, June 3rd, at 7.05. And tickets are available as usual at all Ticketron outlets. Shea Stadium's advanced ticket window, or you can pick up that phone and call 718-507-TIXX for information. That's Mets baseball excellence again and again. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, that's a big beach towel right there. I mean, if you're going to snuggle, why not snuggle at the park? Yes. You need somebody to snuggle with tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Freezing out here. Roger McDowell into the game for New York. And he's facing Candy Maldonado. First pitch for a strike. 0-1 oh, to Candy. Roger making his 18th appearance of the season. He's 1-4. Oh, and two to Candy Maldonado. Roger has struggled. So has Candy. Yep. Roger's last three decisions, losses. Candy Maldonado entering the game, batting 189. The Mets trail seven to three here in the seventh. And Maldonado continues to struggle. First strikeout for McDowell and Terry Kennedy coming up. Roger one and four with four saves and that ERA has ballooned of late as he has fallen on hard times. Maldonado certainly on hard times now two for his last 19 at bats and from that at bat it's clear that Candy does not have a clue right now at the plate. He's 0 for four tonight. Two strikeouts as Terry Kennedy takes a strike. Kennedy came in with the bases loaded against McDowell at Shea Stadium and cleared the bases with a double on the first pitch, a high sinker to left field. So he's one for one against McDowell lifetime. Ground ball toward second. Tuffle to McDowell, two outs. Let's check out the Nissan National League scoreboard. Pittsburgh defeated Cincinnati to help the Giants, two to nothing. It was Chicago over Atlanta three to two and we had an early report that Atlanta had won that game. So this says Chicago won. Houston over St. Louis eight to four in the eighth inning L.A. leads Montreal three to one and a final San Diego over Philadelphia nine to three. Jose Uribe now that's an old uh, dugout joke. You saw the Dodgers over Montreal three to one. Somebody yell out in the dot in the dugout Montreal won. And everybody looks toward the uh, toward the scoreboard 
And then the guy who said it says Los, Los Angeles, Angeles three. 3. You got it. <laughs> oh and one to Uribe. <laughs> Tight. One and one to Jose Uribe. Fly ball to center. And Tuffle can't get to it. So Uribe with a California leaguer <laughs> into center field. And here's Ed Urak, who will be the pinch hitter. For Atlee Hamaker and Mike Lacoste will be the pitcher for the Giants in the eighth inning. Uribe hits it down by the trademark, and Tuffle just can't get back there in time. It hardly bends a blade of grass when it hits, but it's a base hit. How can you pinch hit for a guy that's five for nine? <laughs> that's what Atlee Hamaker is. <laughs> or what is he? Four for nine. He's yeah. four for nine. Still pretty darn good. Ed Urak, 9 for 36 on the year. And I've got the perfect nickname for Chris Berman to use if Ed Urak does something that makes the highlights. Ball one. Go ahead. I don't know how good it is, but I think it's perfect. Ed Urak acid. <laughs> it would only be used in a 7-3 to three game. Surely you're kidding. I'm not kidding, and don't call me Shirley. <laughs> Two balls and no strikes to Ed Urak. <laughs> Seven to three, <laughs> San Francisco. See, Urak, like mine, has got to be cleaned up <laughs> as Jeffries throws out. Ed Urak, no runs in one hit and one left after seven. It's seven to three San Francisco, and we're back after this from Manufacturers Hanover. <laughs> Maybe not. There's a young chilly dude enjoying the game and other things here at <laughs> Candlestick. But the Mets are not enjoying their first visit to the stick this year. They're trailing seven to three and the Giants with a new pitcher Mike Lacoste on the mound. Len Dykstra will be the first to face Mike Lacoste. Lacoste two and three on the year. This is his 20th appearance and he has picked up six saves and he becomes the third San Francisco pitcher of the night. Mike with a save and he saved Mike Kruko's game when the Giants played the Mets at Shea Stadium. Throws a lot of sinkers as Dykstra takes a high sinker that he thought was too high. No balls, one strike to Lynn Dykstra. One for two, an RBI and a run scored. Low ball one. Hamaker certainly pinched well in his two innings, but it's getting to the point where as poorly as the Mets are hitting, you're not sure whether it's the Mets or the pitching. Mm -hmm. Tapper towards second. Robbie Thompson throws out Dykstra. Here's the Nissan American League scoreboard. The Mariners beat the Yankees 3-2. It was the A's over the Red Sox 4-2. The Orioles winning first place in the East, leading six to two. The final Cleveland over Toronto, six to two. California got by Milwaukee. The Angels are having a heck of a year, three to two. Minnesota over Kansas City, seven to one. And it was Detroit ten, Chicago three. Kansas City one. Uh, Minnesota seven. Right. <laughs> Here's Tim Tuffle, who is one for three. Make that one for two on the night. Seven to three Giants here in the eighth. Strike one. <laughs> Slider outside, one and one. We'll be on the air Friday night, 7.30 New York time, and it'll be 
Doc Gooden against John Smiley. And then Sunday afternoon, Doug Drabeck against Sid Fernandez. The Mets go home for three. And then they hit the road again, playing four in Chicago and four in Pittsburgh. Two balls and a strike to Tim Tuffle. Drilled a foul, two and two. Two, one out here in the eighth. Giants up by four. Hit to right field. Maldonado on the run, and it's a fair ball. And a ground rule double. Ruled a ground rule double by first base umpire Jerry Lane as Tim Tuffle pulls into second base with his second double of the year. And Tuffle's second hit of the night. He's also been on base on a walk. So Tuffle's been on base now three times. Maldonado playing over toward right center had no chance to get to this ball and as it bounds in fair territory it kicks well out of play as you can see. So Tuffle at second base one out and Howard Johnson the batter. Hojo one for three on the night with a run scored. He singled in the fourth inning and scored on Daryl Strawberry's double. Popped up. Second baseman Robbie Thompson. Two outs. And Daryl Strawberry now the batter, who's one for two. He doubled in Johnson, as we said, in the fourth inning. Outside and high, ball one. He went too far, one and one. I think that swing has been, and that's not toward Daryl or anything, but that indecision is what we've seen for the most part all season long on the part of Met hitters. They're not really as aggressive as they should be. And that perpetuates itself. Out of play, one and two to Strawberry. When you're tentative and you don't have good results and you start pressing, you tend to feed on that and it tends to snowball on you. You lose confidence, you get more tentative. Consequently, the half swing, the indecision, the lack of aggressiveness. Better to make a decisive wrong decision than an indecisive right one. High ball two, two and two. And that goes with pitching too. Who knows what the right pitch selection is? You don't know until the pitch is thrown. Curveball might not be the right pitch, but if you throw it with enough conviction, if you do anything with enough conviction, you turn a wrong decision into a right decision through your execution. Three and two to Strawberry. Outfield obviously shading Strawberry to pull. Mitchell about straight away in left field. Darrell with power to all fields. Grounded sharply to Clark. The Cape has it. We go to the middle of the eighth inning with the Mets trailing seven to three and we're back after this from Lee Miles. Not a good memory for the Mets tonight, but back on May 27, 1987, the top of the ninth inning with none on, the score tied 3-3. Gary Carter hit a game-winning home run off Don Robinson. Final score, Mets 4, Giants 3. Nobody beats the Wiz, but the Giants are beating the Mets tonight, and here's Steve. Thank you, Timmy. You're welcome. Brett Butler, the leadoff batter, leads off the eighth inning. And he takes a strike from Roger McDowell, the count 
one ball one strike Butler flied to shallow left and popped to second his first two times up he tripled in a run in the fourth inning for his 13th RBI and then he had a bunt single and scored in the sixth so he's two for four as he fouls it off one and two. Butler now hitting 309 on the year with his two for four tonight. And he chops another one that's going to go foul outside first. Still one and two. I guess Butler also needs to be given a great deal of credit for the Giants' success. He's given them the leadoff batter Roger Craig's been looking for. He's gotten on base to such a degree along with Robbie Thompson that Will Clark and Kevin Mitchell have been able to combine for 89 RBIs and 25 home runs so far this year. High and tight, two and two. Each slot in a batting order is designed for a different purpose. A leadoff slot is exactly that. You lead off basically to get on base but really for the most part you are technically a leadoff batter in only one inning and that's the first you may be a clutch hitter in the fourth or the fifth or the sixth in this game Butler has led off the third or the first the third the sixth and now the eighth and Dykstra with a great catch. Well that great defensive play by Len Dykstra certainly was a sure stop yes it was mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that sure stop was brought to you by sure deodorant it's catchy <laughs> and here's the sure stop right here one out for Robbie Thompson who is two for three plus a walk Thompson has stolen a base and scored a run as well. You might know that our first sure stop spot of 1989. There's another one. Mm -hmm. But our first sure stop spot of 1989 with Lenny's arms extended. Raise your hand if you're sure. Right. Two out and nobody on and Will the Thrill strides to the plate to the applause of the remaining crowd. Will with a two for three night plus a walk with an infield base hit and a three run home run. He has scored two runs and driven in three. His 10th home run of the year coming in the sixth inning. And he takes high ball one. Clark has not slowed down any and leading the league in hitting now hitting 368. He's hit in 13 of his last 14 hitting over 400 during the last 14 games. He goes down and gives Roger McDowell a look. No, come on. I don't think there's anything here. You got to throw it here. some ice, Pete. Give me a break. Two balls, no strike. That's a, a crowd reaction, but not necessarily Clark's. Will gets up and looks at Roger. There's a difference between a look and a glare. Fouls this one back out of play, and it's two balls, one strike. Two out, and nobody on here in the eighth inning, and the Giants leading by four, seven to three. Three and one. In the last 14 games in which Clark has hit over 400, he has driven in 16 runs. So he and Mitchell are putting the pedal to the metal here. They're not backing off at all. Ball four. Before the game, I talked to Kevin Mitchell about the success he's having, and he says in spite of Roger Craig's influence, and playing every day, one of the biggest reasons is being able to be in the batting order with Will Clark. 
Well, I think, you know, with playing with Will, um, he's in front of me a lot, you know, and um, going out there just watching him excites me. And we try to compete against each other. And that's what makes us a good, such good competitors. Uh, we go out there. If he don't do the job, I have to go out there and try to do it. And I tell myself, they're my my RBIs, and I got to drive them in. Well, it certainly has been working for Kevin Mitchell, who leads the major leagues in home runs and RBIs and just picked up his second hit of the night with a single to left. I'll tell you, you talk about a fortuitous sound bite. Mitchell with a three run homer tonight and Will Clark with a three run homer. They're competing quite nicely. You, thank you. You bet they are to the delight of Roger Craig and the Giants but the, to to the dismay of the Mets and the rest of the National League for that matter. So with two out two men aboard. And the batter Ernest Riles who's one for four and takes outside for ball one. Riles with a base hit to left field in the fifth inning. He's flied out his other three times up. And he rips one down the right field line. Strawberry going back. Home run. Line drive home run another three run home run for the Giants and they now lead it ten to four. Coming into this game the New York Mets this year have hit two three run homers two. The San Francisco Giants have one more three run homer in this game than the Mets have had all season long. Ten to three Giants. Third home fourth home run of the year for Ernest Riles. And he now has 15 RBIs as Candy Maldonado fouls one off. Maldonado sort of the antithesis of the rest of the Giant lineup. Not only is he 0 for 4 tonight, but he's only had two hits in his last 19 at bats. First home run of the year, by the way, given up by Roger McDowell. He gave up only one last year to Bo Diaz. That ball that Riles hit got out of here in a quick hurry. That was that slider that just kind of sat on the inside part of the plate, but not for long. Riles hit it like it was sitting on a tee. Mm -hmm. The sinker grounded to short. Johnson over to Magadan, and the inning is over. But the Mets woes continue. The third three run home run of the night. This one by Ernest Riles. And after eight, it is 10 to 3 San Francisco. Back to the stick after this for Express Mail. Ernest Riles and Roger Craig saying how much he likes the addition of this guy. He's got to love it after the three run home run by Riles. Kevin McReynolds leads off the ninth inning for New York. Mets down now by seven runs. Ten hits or rather ten runs on 14 hits for the Giants. Mike Lacoste and the base hit lined up the middle. The second hit given up by Lacoste the third Giants pitcher of the night. So McReynolds aboard in the ninth. He's now one for four. Hit number eight overall for New York. And here's Dave Magadan, who is 0 for 3. And since Dave has taken over at first base for the injured Keith Hernandez, nursing the broken kneecap, he hasn't had very many offers. David has flied deep to center, grounded to the pitcher, and lined to left. Strike one. Well as we mentioned earlier David Johnson with the State of the Union address today saying that the Mets are not going to do anything drastic they're going to go along here and line drive by a diving Uribe for a base hit to center field so the Mets with two singles to open the ninth inning. And then after Davey makes the speech the Mets find themselves in a 10 to 3 ball game. Line sharply by the diving Uribe. So Magadan picks up his first hit of the ballgame, the ninth for the Mets. 
Yeah, I heard what you said about Greg Jeffries. I didn't know that until you said it about Davies protection of Magan and I do not however think he's been us unjustly criticized as a matter of fact reading the newspapers hearing the broadcast the general demeanor of the press concerning Jeffries in my opinion has been quite subtle and not not uh, criticizing at all right. I think Davey is saying that to protect Jeffries I understand where Davey's coming from but I don't believe that the media has been that tough on Jeffries well, he, he may get a little tougher as he grounds into a double play here in the ninth inning with McReynolds moving to third, but now there are two out. Boy, the Giants can turn him. They turn this one beautifully. They're second of the night, and they lead the league with 55 already this year. <laughs> well, I agree with you, Timmy. I think that for the most part, the media in general has given Jeffries every opportunity Why, sure and I don't think anybody has heaped the troubles of this ball club on his young shoulders fouled back and out of play by you know, Mackie look, Sasser. Look, I mean let's face it I mean everybody understands Greg Jeffries is 21 years old but this is a big guy's game I mean you grow up in a hurry in this game and sympathy goes right down the window right out the window and everybody is empathetic certainly with with Greg but I'm sure Greg even wouldn't want sympathy and he's not getting any but I don't believe he's being unjustly or overly criticized either Thompson will throw it to Clark to end the ball game and the Giants have taken the first two of this three game series the Mets woes on this West Coast road trip continue as San Francisco wins it 10 to 3. The winning pitcher is Mike Kruko, who went five and a third, picks up his fourth win against two losses. And the losing pitcher, David Cohn. David pitched four innings, and his record falls to three and four on the year. Tim and I'll be back to wrap it up from Candlestick. Ralph will be along with the late night edition of Kiner's Corner. Stay with us. Back at San Francisco after this for the United Parcel Service. Steve Zabriskie and Tim McCarver back with you at Candlestick Park in San Francisco where the Giants put it all over the Mets tonight, 10 to 3. And earlier in the season, and really, I guess, Timmy, until recently, the Mets were really never blown out of a game. And, yep. and a couple of times on this trip, they have been. The pitching has been holding up surprisingly well in spite of the fact that the Mets still aren't hitting. But now it looks like the pitching is giving way under the pressure. And that, if the Mets don't start hitting, uh, could make their woes mount even further. Well, that could happen if you have one uh, department like your your pitching staff uh, that is carrying your ball club. It can turn into home runs like uh, happened tonight with the three three-run homers. Remember, the Mets had only two three-run homers coming into tonight's game, and the Giants uh, with three this evening. Uh, uh, Candlestick Park, known as the Stick, and tonight I guess it was appropriately <laughs> named. The Sticks were out. Were they ever? And the Giants have got some sticks. Mm -hmm. uh, aside from Greg Jeffries' part in Davy Johnson's State of the Union address today, in which he also said that, for the most part, the Mets are expected to remain status quo at least for a while. How do you feel about that? Do you think that the Mets need to do something other than just go along as they are right now in an effort to get out of? the malaise that they're in well I don't know I think you give Greg Jeffries more of an opportunity to prove himself because last year he was in the same type of funk in June and he came out of it in June in June he busted out all over <laughs> and eventually ended up hitting 282 and had a pretty good year but uh, I, I think you have to do the same with him this year I mean after all this is a guy that you made a determination on to stick with as far as strawberry Johnson uh, uh, you know, Dave Magadan, the guys that you just have to hang with them and hope they can come out of it. Well, it's ridiculous it. to think that the Mets are going to throw it in and make some kind of a big multiplayer deal and try to do something like that. Yeah, Ralph and I talked about it on the. Uh, there's, there's nothing wrong with this ball club right now that a couple of eight to one, seven to two wins uh, won't cure. But uh, the West, the uh, West Coast has really been uh, a bad trip for them. They're now two and six. And uh, five uh, one-run losses coming into the night, but tonight was no doubt about it from the get-go. Well, I'll tell you something. One of the guys that has made it a bad trip for the Mets and a bad trip for the rest of the National League is Kevin Mitchell, and he is our Budweiser player of the game tonight. Mitchell leading the major leagues in home runs and RBIs. Hit a three-run homer tonight, his 15th home run of the year. He now has 47 
ribbies to go with those 15 taters. And he leads the major leagues in both departments. So Kevin is our Budweiser player of the game. And we'll be right back with a final word from San Francisco after this for Bud Light. Here are the totals, and the Mets don't like them. For the Giants, 10 runs on 14 hits, no errors. The Mets with three runs, as per usual, and only scoring one in each instance. For a total of three runs on nine hits and no errors, Mike Kruko, for five and a third innings, picks up his fourth win. He's four and two on the year, and the losing pitcher, David Cohn, falls to three and four. Tim? All right, Stevie, New York Mets baseball has been brought to you by Bush Beer, the beer with a taste as smooth as its name. By Nissan, building cars for people who want more than just a means of getting from here to there. Nissan, built for the human race. By Manufacturers Hanover, the financial source worldwide. By The Wiz, remember, for anything in home entertainment, nobody beats The Wiz. By the Hyatt Hotels and Resorts. On your next trip, feel the Hyatt touch. And by AT&T, the right choice. Our guest this evening will receive from Verdi Travelwear a new modern tweed luggage set made of strong, extra durable fabric, ideal for long wear. Verdi Travelwear, available at fine stores everywhere. Also, a sharp remote control compact disc player with eight times oversampling and 20 track programmability. The new point of view from Sharp Audio. Fans, be with us again on Friday when Doc Gooden goes for the Mets against John Smiley of the Pittsburgh Pirates. 7.30 game time right here on WWOR-TV. Now stay tuned for Kiner's Corner. Ralph's special guest we think is going to be Kevin Mitchell. The executive producer of Mets Baseball 89 is Rick Miner, produced and directed by Jeff Mitchell. Associate producer, Steve Olbaum. The announcers on the preceding telecast were approved and contracted for by Sterling Doubleday Enterprises. And this has been a presentation of WWOR-TV Sports. Good morning, everybody.